Brother Fraser ended his reading in Acts chapter 8, and the story of the man who was saved reading the word of God with these words. And he went on his way rejoicing. I was pondering that today, and I have a little message I want to give you at the end of the gospel meeting. I wouldn't do this at the beginning, but I want to do it at the end. So I'd like to ask you to turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. And for those of you who are using the page numbers uh, to find your way to navigate in the Bible, it's page 874. 874. <clears throat> Luke chapter 15. And this is, as you know, a lengthy chapter. And I'm not going to read all of it because I'm not going to speak about all of it. I'm actually going to speak about one word that's found in it, but it's repeated eight or nine or ten times in this chapter, and I want to highlight that in your thinking. So the chapter begins with a man who lost a sheep. I, I would think that if you had a hundred sheep and you lost one, you might write it off on your taxes and just figure that it wasn't all that important. But this man saw a value in that sheep that led him to go out and seek for that sheep. And I just want to read a couple of verses beginning at verse number 5. So page 874, Luke chapter 15, and verse 5, And when he has found it, the lost sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, Christ says, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety and nine righteous persons who see no need for repentance. Now, the second story in this chapter involves a woman now who has not a hundred sheep, but she has ten silver coins. May well be that the ten silver coins were more valuable than a hundred sheep. I'm not sure, but clearly they were items of value to her. And one of those coins is lost. Now, break into the story at verse 9. And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, Christ says, I tell you there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, the last story is the most familiar of the stories. It's the story of a boy who is very willful and very wayward. We call him the prodigal son. Unfortunately, the word prodigal has dropped out of the English language, and so I'm just going to call him the wayward, the, the, the wandering, the, the disobedient son. And he runs away from his father. He squanders the money that his father has given him. He wastes everything until he is utterly broken. And in his brokenness, he realizes that the father loved him all along, that the father's house was the only place that he had ever enjoyed true blessing. And so he begins the long journey back to his father. Now let's just read from verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. And while he was yet a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Can you, can you fail to be touched by that? That this boy who had gone so far. I actually don't think that this is the story of the prodigal son. I think this is the story of a loving father. That's what I would write down in my Bible. Because there was a father who was waiting for this boy to come home. And he runs. And he embraces him. And he kisses him. And the son says to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. 
The father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and rejoice or in the ESV to celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. Now, you know, there's a story of the older son and all of that. I won't read that, but I want to read the last chapter or the last verse of the, of the chapter. Luke chapter 15 and verse 32. It was fitting. It is suitable. It is appropriate to celebrate, to rejoice, to be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. There are a lot of directions that you can go from these stories, one of which I touched the other night. And that is, is that God only sees two people. He sees people in one of two ways. And in this story and in these stories, we discover that the Lord Jesus is teaching that people are either lost or they're found. They are either dead or they are alive. They are in their sins or they have the forgiveness of sins. They are without Christ or they have Christ eternally. Let me begin again tonight by just asking this question gently of all of you who are here. Which of those two categories describes you? Are you lost? Or have you been found? Were you spiritually dead? Or are you now the possessor of eternal life? You see, for every person who is saved, there has been a moment in their life when there has been a tremendous change. Once I was far from God, like the prodigal son. There was a day I came home and was embraced by the Father. I confessed that I had sinned, and he received me with open arms. Oh, the joy of coming to Christ. That's my message tonight, actually, because I want to tell you what a wonderful thing it is to be saved. You know, there are a lot of things that we, of necessity, must preach. We must preach about the reality of sin. To fail to do that. Listen, there's no point in being saved if there's nothing to be saved from. And so we must preach about the reality of sin in our lives, even for little children. To understand that we are sinners and that we're guilty before God. There is a necessity to preach about judgment that looms over those whose sins are not forgiven. And I want to tell you something. If I didn't find this in the Word of God, it would be something that I would never preach about. <laughs> if there was a man that ever stood up that took joy in preaching about the judgment of God, somebody ought to drag him off the platform and never allow him there again. There's no joy in that. But there is a measure of faithfulness that is required. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. And I would not be Christ's servant if I failed to tell you that your sin is leading you to mo the most horrible and unending and eternal consequences. But there's a part of the gospel that I think sometimes just gets a little bit overlooked, and that is this. The wonderful peace and joy that comes when a person receives Christ. I tell you what, I'm glad to be saved. I don't mind saying it. I, I, I love to look back over the years to that moment when the, when the difficulty and the darkness and the, and, and the despair of being in my sins was relieved in a single moment when I trusted Christ. I'll tell you something. You can forget about a lot of things in life. I, I don't remember what the preachers preached on that night. And I don't remember the color of the wallpaper in a bedroom where I was sleeping, and I don't remember what time it was on the clock, but I remember the immense relief and joy that came into my soul when I came to Christ. 
I think that is highlighted in what we have read, isn't it? Because even though the circumstances were different, different things were lost. A sheep was lost. A coin was lost. Even a son was lost. Yet at the conclusion of every story, the highlight is this. There was joy. There was rejoicing. There was celebration. In the first two stories, the joy was on the part of the person who found it. But in the last story, to me, it makes it the most precious one. There's not only joy on the part of the father who found his son, but they rejoiced together. There was the joy of the boy who had been found. I want to tell you about some of the joy of God's salvation. I want to think, first of all, about the joy of knowing that the burden of your sin is lifted. Did you ever go to work on Monday morning or go to school, maybe on Monday morning, and somebody comes dragging into the classroom or the cafeteria, and uh, we, we have a little saying, we say they have the weight of the world on them. You know, they're just staggering in, and their brow is furrowed, and you can tell that things have not gone right, and you don't know whether it's in their home or whether it's in something that they've done, but you can tell that, there, that there's a burden that they're, that they're carrying. And I, I'm just going to be very honest, we live in a profoundly burdened world. I, I have neighbors who are wealthy people, and yet they seem to be burdened. It, it's not satisfying them. It's not giving them joy. I, I see people, and they're, they're able to travel around the world, and they're able to indulge themselves in every kind of toy and pleasure that, that you can possibly imagine. And yet they're not happy. They're not satisfied. They have a burden, and I'll tell you the sad thing is most of them don't, know, don't even know what the burden is. But I want to tell you that if you have never trusted Christ, there is a burden of sin that you are carrying tonight. I remember reading a story about a man who, uh, he was, I think he was turning 50, and he was having a middle-aged crisis, and so he decided that he needed to do something to, uh, to sort of get rid of the, the angst that he was feeling. So he decided that he was going to hike on the Appalachian Trail. And, and you know that goes from Springer Mountain down in the southeastern part of the United States in Georgia, and it goes for a 1,000 miles or so all the way to Mount Katahdin up in Maine, uh, uh, east of here. And, uh, but, but he got thinking, his wife told him he couldn't do it by himself. And so he wrote around to all his, his high school buddies and says, is there anybody that wants to, wants to come with me? And, and one fellow said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to come. Well, the story is hilarious, really, because uh, he meets the man at the airport, and he discovers that if there was ever a man who was an exhibition of uh, not being in good shape, this guy was it. He was overweight. He was flabby. He was weak. Uh, uh, and, and he had a backpack that you know, weighed like 200 pounds. And the way the story unfolds, of course, is, is that for the first 10 miles of that trip, the trail was littered with all the junk that they took out of his backpack. It was a burden that was just too heavy for that man to carry. And so he was discarding the kitchen sink and the, you know, the toaster and all the things that this man was trying to carry. The reason I mention that is just this. There may be burdens in life that you are able to relieve, but there is no one here tonight that is able to relieve the burden of their sin. I meet people who are trying it all the time. Well, I just don't think about it. I just try to forget about it. I just try to do enough good things that somehow at the end of the day that God will look at the good things and forget the bad things. Let me tell you something. The burden of our sin grows moment by moment in our life. And I wish no ill on anybody, but I want you to listen carefully. It would be my prayer, it is my prayer, and it is the prayer of the believers here, that before these meetings go another five minutes, that you will begin to feel heavily the burden of your sin. I'm going to say something rather bold. Hope you don't mind. People who never feel the burden of their sin never seek relief from those sins. That's why Jesus said, come unto me. Everybody who's laboring 
and carrying a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. My beloved friend tonight, let me tell you that there was a man who carried a burden at Calvary. Mr. Fraser's already been telling you about this tonight. There was a Savior who had no burden of his own, save his love for you and me. And yet at the cross, he took the burden of our sin upon himself. And in the place of guilty sinners, experience the wrath of God that we deserve. And because of what he did, he can say, if you come to me, I will give you rest. Is there anybody here that would like their burden lifted? Like, you don't need to answer me. You don't need to answer your parents or your spouse or your friend sitting next to you. But listen, God is here tonight. Did you know that? Every time the gospel is preached, God is, God is here. He is present. The fact that you don't see him is irrelevant. He's here. And I want to tell you what he's doing. He's listening to the answer of your heart right now. See, this is, we're not playing games. These are eternal realities that we're handling. That's why we're not fooling around and telling light stories and joking around with people. This is about your soul. It's about eternity. It's about a God who is, sees us and he listens to our hearts. What does God hear right now? Look right up here at me. What does God hear right now? When I ask you, is there someone here that would like to have the burden of their sin lifted? Answer carefully. And I hope that God will see in this meeting, right at this very moment, young girls and young boys and teenagers and adults who would like to know the magnificent joy of the burden of their sin lifted forever. I want to tell you, about the joy of having the barrier of sin removed. If God's salvation is pictured as a burden being lifted, it's also pictured as a barrier that is being removed. Because I want you to remember some very simple things. I like to try and say memorable things that people will recall, that will stick in your mind. And here's one of them. The thing that keeps people out of heaven is their sin. That's why we can't go there. It's not a place for people who are covered with sin. Sin stands as a, as a barrier that you and I cannot climb over. That barrier must be removed by someone else, or you and I will never be in heaven. I remember having a gospel series in a town called, in Northern California called Chico, California. There was a very nice man there, a Hispanic man, who uh, was, was really troubled about his sin. But he was really having trouble understanding how he could personally enter into the good of God's salvation. And I remember sitting after the meeting, it was getting kind of late, and uh, he, the poor man, I, I, just, I, I wanted to do something to help illustrate to him what, what it meant to be saved. And uh, we were just kind of sitting up in the front, and there was a there was, I can't see right here now, but there's an exit door like this. There was an exit door right behind me. And so finally, I, I was feeling a little frustrated. I, I finally stood up and I grabbed a whole row of chairs and I brought it over and I stuck it in front of the door. And I said to him, if this place catches on fire, do we have a problem? He said, yes, we do. I said, what's the problem? Well, he said, there's a barrier between us and safety. I said, what would have to happen for us to be able to leave this dangerous situation, fire behind us? What would have to happen for us to be allowed to move to a place of safety? He said, the barrier would have to be... <laughs> I think he got saved before the end of the sentence because it dawned on him that that's exactly what he needed. And that's exactly what Christ did. Between my soul and blessing was the great barrier of my sin. And yet the Lord Jesus in matchless grace came to take those sins away. Our sins, 
the Bible says, have separated between us and God. And I want to just remind you that 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 barrier has been removed. The burden has been lifted. And I can rejoice in God's great salvation. I just have a couple of minutes. Let me tell you one more. The joy of having the burden of sin lifted. You could sing that grand old hymn, Burdens Are Lifted at Calvary. Do you like that one? I love it. And you could have the joy of knowing that the barrier of sin was removed. Nothing standing between you and God. Nothing standing between you and heaven. Nothing standing between you and the Lord Jesus. Here's another one just to think about briefly. I want you to think about the joy of the bondage of sin that can be broken. The Lord Jesus in John chapter 8 makes a very, very significant point. It's just this. That in our sins, we are the slaves of sin. Now, you know that in this racially charged environment that we're living in right now, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of talk about slavery. And, of course, it was something that was evil and something that was really... um, should never have happened, and I think all of us can rejoice, at least in this country, that it's gone. Tragically, in the world tonight, there are more slaves, actually, they say, than there have ever been in history. But the fact of the matter is, is that people who are slaves long for freedom. They long that the shackles of slavery will be broken. I want to tell you something. If you're not saved tonight, you are a slave of sin. And what's worse than that, you are incapable of freeing yourself. This may shock a couple of you, but I was in prison once. Well, I was riding around in a police car with some friends of mine, and they said, would you like to know what it feels like to be in jail? And I said, yeah, I'd like to see what that's like. And I'll tell you what, it's pretty indelibly seared on my memory what it was like to step through that door and hear that steel door shut behind me. And since they were my friends, they didn't let me out right away. They left me in there for a while, and they thought that that was great great fun. Uh, For them, maybe, but not so for me. I just got a little snapshot of what it was like to be enslaved, to be held by the power of another, to be unable to free myself from that jail cell. I'll tell you what, the click of the key and the swinging of the door and a breath of fresh air because it stunk was absolutely amazing. You know what, people who, people who are liberated by Jesus Christ It is the most exhilarating thing that can happen in a life. Listen to what the Lord Jesus said. I don't know, but this might be my favorite verse in all the Bible. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be, and I'm going to make it in plain English, you will be truly free. I'm free tonight. Not just because I'm from a free country and because I'm visiting in a free country, not simply because I'm not the subject of chattel slavery or anything like that, but because Jesus Christ has set me free. I like the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. He wasn't speaking about spiritual things, but I'm going to recast them. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. God has set me free, and I am rejoicing as I'm preaching. You may not be able to see it on my face, but in my soul, I'm smiling from ear to ear. My burden is gone. Hmm? My barrier has been removed. My bondage has been broken because of Jesus Christ. You can go to heaven without your friends. You can go to heaven without any funds. You can go to heaven with all sorts of things, but you can't go to heaven without Christ. You can live without Christ, and you can die without Christ, but you can't be in heaven without him.
May God turn your heart to the Lord Jesus. He's the one who died. He's the one who suffered. He's the one who shed his blood. He's the one who lives tonight as a Savior who longs to receive you. Anybody interested? Anybody want to rejoice tonight? Do you know you could come into this meeting sad and you could leave this meeting glad? And people have done it in this very room. Saved. Safe. Certain. For all eternity. May God give you the joy of his great salvation. Let's pray.